Good morning, everyone. Delighted to see all of you interested in the existential threat to humanity. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Um, so our session this morning is on superbugs, avoiding an existential threat to humanity. And I'm so delighted to be joined by our distinguished panelists, including Peter Pio at the end, director and HANDA professor of global health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Peter Jackson, executive director of the AMR Center, Ron Daniels, CEO of the UK Sepsis Trust, and Valeria Bortoloya, Senior Researcher of the National Food Institute at the Technical University of Denmark. This is a critical topic, as I'm sure many of you know being here in the audience today, as antibiotic resistance is one of the biggest public health challenges of our time. Infections caused by antibiotic resistant germs kill about 50,000 in Europe and North America alone each year. And about 700,000 die each year globally from drug resistance and illnesses such as bacterial infections, malaria, HIV AIDS, or tuberculosis. <clears throat> if no action is taken, then death rates will increase significantly, and some estimate about 10 million by 2050 to wipe out about $100 trillion in the global economy. And routine medical procedures such as surgeries, cancer therapies, and treatment of chronic diseases become even more difficult to treat or to perform. Antibiotic resistance is also a threat to the food supply, and we'll talk a lot about that today, as well as the environment, as antibiotic use in animals affect both humans, animal health, and the ability of resistant germs in animals to contaminate meat or other animal products. And furthermore, animal waste containing resistant germs are able to run into the environment, contaminating it. Leadership through influential and powerful institutions in the UK has led to a call for a global comprehensive strategy to address AMR. The United States Centers for Disease Control has also issued the AMR challenge for governments, private industries, and non-governmental organizations worldwide to make commitments that further the progress against AMR. The Milken Institute and countless others have signed up to that challenge. I welcome you today to uh, promote uh, the work and the topics that are going to be discussed on this panel through social media apps. Um, you can also download the Milken Institute app for a schedule of today's programs. So we're going to begin the discussion of the panel, well, with the panel and address key questions, so we'll have a conversation here. At about 10 minutes left, I'll also allow audience questions as well, so prepare those in advance. I will be, I'll first turn it over to Peter Pio. Okay. So Peter, given the history of global leadership in the UK that's been provided on AMR, um, could you give us a landscape overview of what has happened here in the UK and the work that's happened across government and other sectors? And can you also discuss the scale of the problem of the growing antimicrobial resistance, both here in the UK, but also globally as well? Thanks, Esther, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, if this gets out of control, this being drug-resistant infections, we really have a total nightmare scenario when it comes to health. Today, people in our countries die far more from diabetes and the complications of chronic diseases and so on. And that's thanks to the fact that we've had antibiotics, that we have vaccines, that infections have been brought under control, hygiene and so on. Um, but this is a really new challenge that is entirely man-made. Um, it is due, as we will hear, um, uh, you know, misuse of antibiotics. Now, on the other hand, uh, it's a totally natural phenomenon. Uh, the ultimate uh, purpose in life of a microbe, it's just for us, is to stay alive. And when there is evolutionary pressure, in other words, like prescription of antibiotics or um, anti-malaria um, mm -hmm. drugs, the, you know, the, uh, uh, the bugs will try to survive by mutating and acquiring <coughs> ways of resisting. Now, um, I would say after this morning's um, uh, panel on the Brexit and, and so on the, and the future of the UK, I think this is one area where the UK has really excelled uh, in terms of soft diplomacy with... Uh, you know, uh, if antimicrobial resistance, drug-resistant infections are on the world's agenda today, it's thanks to the UK. Mm -hmm. It really, there, it's, it's very easy to trace. 
It's thanks to the work of people like uh, Sally Davis, the chief medical officer, um, of Jim O'Neill and his, uh, you know, really a very creative report that took a completely different view, not just looking at it, uh, people like me, I'm an infectious disease physician and epidemiologist, um, you know, in terms of life saves and all that and, and what it does to people, but also what can we do about it, what are the drivers. Um, so coming from a, an economic background, he and his team came up with what I think is the best report in terms of what we can do about it. And um, this requires multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral uh, type of approaches. That's what we're also doing at the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. Our uh, center on antimicrobial resistance is headed by a microbiologist and an anthropologist. And people say, what does an anthropologist have to do with antimicrobial resistance? Mm -hmm. Well, because it's a lot about people. It's about behavior. And we're not going to fix this with just new antibiotics or dealing with, you know, better prescription. We need to everything. So thanks to this action of the UK, um, we had a discussion on this in the UN General Assembly. Um, this is where all countries in the world come together. And uh, it has brought really the discussion at a higher level. It was discussed at the G7, the G20, the World Economic Forum, um, and uh, the colleagues who are here with me are an, an illustration of this leadership and of the fact that we mm -hmm. are really uh, taking this on now. But the key will be to sustain the momentum. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sometimes easier to put something on the map. That's the first step. Yes. And that's fantastic. That has been done. Now we have to make sure that all the fantastic resolutions and commitments and all that are being implemented and that we sustain the momentum. Thank you. So Peter Jackson, yes. um, this issue is both healthcare related. We talk about prescribing practices and the use or overuse of antibiotics, mm -hmm. but it's also a question of innovation and where pharmaceutical companies are in developing the next generation of antibiotics. Could you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing at the AMR Center and the role of small and medium-sized enterprises in solving for this pharmaceutical part of this equation? That's right, Esther, thank you. Uh, of course, it's not only um, uh, prescribing um, surveillance, uh, minimizing the use of antibiotics. One of the key recommendations from Lord O'Neill's report was the need for new therapeutics and vaccines because what we're seeing is Darwin in action. Mm. Uh, the mm. bugs are evolving to the pressures that Peter described faster than we can traditionally develop new therapeutics to, as countermeasures to that. In the UK, uh, at, like elsewhere in the world, uh, big pharma companies have over the years pulled back from their investments in antibiotics because I think there's a widespread thought that we'd solve most of the problems. Antibiotics are a huge success story of the last century in eliminating infectious disease um, that were major killers in the in the 19th century but we haven't fully solved the problem uh, the the book because of that underinvestment we don't have an effective pipeline of new therapeutics coming through so I was fortunate enough to lead a, a group of SMEs here in the UK to pull together a report that was published around three weeks ago that described the landscape mm -hmm. that we have uh, I think <coughs> most people would be surprised to know that there's actually no big pharma R&D actually going on in the UK at the moment. And all the heavy lifting on innovation is being done at our excellent uh, world-class academic centres and uh, small to medium enterprises, biotechs. So we surveyed all of, all of those biotechs to try and get a picture of, of uh, the health of the SME pipeline in the UK. Now there are 23 SMEs, um, we've got 47 projects running, currently running in preclinical and clinical trials in the UK, but they are fundamentally under-resourced and under-invested. Those 23 companies only have 47 million pounds on their balance sheets according to companies, companies house, and one company has half of that. Um, so significantly under-resourced for uh, what they need to be able to do Additionally, they have um, limited 
capability available to them because, of, because we don't have uh, big farmer investment and we haven't had for 20, 30 years, there's a real shortage of experts mm -hmm. in, in this field, uh, not only in the UK but worldwide. And uh, in industry, uh, we've estimated that there are actually now fewer than 150 people uh, active in uh, developing new therapeutics for AMO. Now compare that with Cancer Research UK, just that one charity funds over 4,000 researchers. Uh, and this is the scale of, of, well, of the potential impact from AMO uh, is 10 million deaths by 2050. That's more than currently die from cancer. So you can see the poli you know, there's enough policy, uh, there are enough documents out there and reports. Uh, what, what we need now is a, con a concerted conversion of that into action, and in particular in the UK's next five-year AMO strategy. So that needs to recognise the importance of SMEs in this, uh, and uh, also needs to address how do we bring investors, philanthropists, and government finance together uh, to, to bring to bear and recapitalise the research effort in this area. The AMO Centre, um, we set that up about three years ago, uh, became operational last year. We actually work with those SMEs to help fast track their great new technologies from preclinical testing through to clinical trials. Uh, we have our first three programmes uh, that we announced uh, already. Uh, we brought one from Sweden, one from the US, and a UK project, so we're actually bringing international projects to patients and clinical trials here in the UK. And we'll shortly be announcing our next three <coughs> programmes that again are, are international. And you know, we're looking to really build a new critical mass here in the UK to be able to replace the pharma development department that unfortunately no longer exists. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Peter's done a nice job describing the pharmaceutical issue. I'm going to turn over to you, Ron, to talk a little bit more about what do patients experience in a hospital or in a physician setting? Um, and then with the work that you do at the UK Sepsis Trust, what's the link between sepsis and AMR? Well, dealing with the second question first, if I may. Uh, sepsis is, firstly, it's not an infection. Sepsis, the WHO acknowledged in a resolution we presented to them last year that they adopted in May of last year, that sepsis is a syndromic response to infection which is the final common pathway to death from most infectious diseases worldwide. Mm -hmm. So that's the scale issue here. Mm. Sepsis can occur as a consequence of AMR, of course. An untreated minor infection increases the likelihood of that patient developing sepsis as a syndromic response. A patient with sepsis secondary to a resistant bacterium or a resistant pathogen has three times higher mortality than a patient who has sepsis as a consequence of a sec sensitive pathogen. So there's a huge problem there with sepsis being a consequence of AMR. In terms of scale, and my colleagues have you know, quite rightly cited yeah. Lord O'Neill's excellent paper, which I think was a bit optimistic actually, because we've got <laughs> oh data now that yeah. suggests that there are not 10 million episodes of sepsis every year globally, but somewhere between 20 and 30 million. And of course, if we can't yeah. treat those cases, then it's highly likely that we'll see not 10 million more deaths by 2050, but perhaps as many as 20 or 30 million deaths. The second thing about sepsis is it's a driver for AMR, because there are pressures facing a clinician when faced with a patient with possible sepsis. They're primarily patient advocacy pressures. It's far more tangible to a clinician at the coalface to see harm to an individual patient than it is to see population-based mm -hmm. harm from over-treatment. Mm -hmm. So there's a tendency to over-treat people with antimicrobials uh, for sepsis. And when we consider the scale of the problem, you can see that that selection pressure is enormous. Mm -hmm. What we need to do as we move forward is to select and precision treat patients. We need to understand with better data, with pattern recognition, which patients require antimicrobials and which do not. If we don't do that, and if we don't act with these other strategies together, then we can see that sepsis and AMR if not addressed right now, that sepsis will be the mode by which global population starts to decline as mm. a consequence of AMR. Mm. So one issue is the prescription practices or prescribing practices and seeing AMR in the healthcare setting, which you aptly described, 
Valeria, could you talk a little bit about beyond the healthcare setting, how do we see AMR present itself in an agricultural setting, the use of antibiotics in animals? Um, and I knew that there is an initiative going on with the One Health strategy. Could you talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah. Thank you, Esther, for the question and good morning to all of you. I think it is uh, quite important if everybody in this room goes out uh, understanding what is the One Health perspective. One Health is a public health concept in which uh, the health of the human, animal and the environment is, uh, tightly, are tightly interconnected. Um, I think it is uh, uh, quite straightforward to understand that uh, if I am sick I could pass uh, my bacteria and my bugs to you because you are nearby me. But I believe uh, not many of you are uh, visiting farms on a daily basis, so you may wonder why is uh, antibiotic use in farms that select for antibiotic resistant bacteria in farm animals actually affecting me. So if you are eating meat or if you are eating vegetables, so I believe all of you in this room uh, fall into these categories, you will be affected because you have to consider that when you use antibiotics in farm animals, you select for resistant bacteria. The farm animals reach us via meat. These resistant bacteria can contaminate the meat we eat, but the resistant bacteria can also contaminate the vegetables we eat because the manure from the farms is used as fertilizer in the fields. Mm. So uh, the One Health is basically a way to see at this uh, at, at health on a very tightly interconnected scale. That is actually what is uh, what is happening. So when we want to address the antibiotic resistant crisis, we cannot only address it in the hospitals where it is definitely very important. It is the first place where we can see the negative consequences. But we should address this also in other sectors, in the environmental sector, in the veterinary sector. Because there, although we may not be able to quantify exactly the relative contribution of these in the, in the human health, we know that there is a contribution there. Mm -hmm. And this is a global issue that I think exacerbates itself in low and middle income countries. Peter Pio, can you talk a little bit about what is the scale in low and middle income countries? Um, you have to balance and weigh the choices between individuals needing antibiotics to survive and the potential for misuse or overabuse of antibiotics. How does that present itself in other countries? Yeah, first of all, let's not forget that there are still hundreds of thousands of people who die particularly children, because of lack of access to antibiotics. So we have to be a bit careful that we're not just throwing away the baby with the bathwater here. And uh, particularly like children with pneumonia and so on, literally hundreds of thousands die. They could also be saved if they would be get the proper vaccination, which is one good strategy. If uh, you're immune to um, bacterial infections, you don't need the antibiotics. But So that's the first point I'd like to make. And that's particularly a problem in low-income countries. Secondly, um, you can, in many countries, you can buy antibiotics over the counter. They may be counterfeit. They may have suboptimal doses. Um, and there is a widespread use that um, is really not the precision thing that Ron talked about um, because there's a, there are no uh, diagnostics. You can't really make a difference between a viral infection where antibiotics would not work against, or uh, a bacterial <coughs> infection where we need antibiotics. And then a, um, an issue that's particularly hitting developing countries, but also Eastern Europe, is multi-drug resistance tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. TB is uh, as old as, uh, we, you know, uh, the street, but um, it is still killing like over a million people a year. And uh, we now have like half a million people who are uh, suffering from multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. And in tuberculosis, we don't have as many uh, alternatives to the classic treatment as we have for other uh, bacterial infections. And that's really uh, the cause of a major, major uh, de cause of death. Um, as I said, particularly in Eastern Europe, but also China, India, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's often associated with HIV infection, which suppresses your immune system, and hence that uh, you know TB becomes far more virulent. Then we have malaria, a big, big killer, and also particularly coming out of the Golden Triangle in uh, you know uh, Burma, uh, Thailand, uh, Cambodia, where people develop um, uh, you know where there are infections that no longer treatable, uh, the classic malaria. So if that spreads to Africa, that would be another disaster. 
So mm. it's a lot of doom and gloom, I would say, but it's not too late. We can do something about it. Are there any bright shining lights? Are there any countries that you can point to, even though they're low and middle income countries, that are really trying to tackle this issue in a more comprehensive way? Yeah, I would say in terms of TB, uh, South Africa recently uh, showed some real leadership. Um, there was a TB um, a special session of the UN General Assembly, but there um, South Africa did not wait for recommendations from the World Health Organization and said we are going to include a new drug called Bedacolin produced by uh, Johnson & Johnson that is the first anti-TB drug since I was a medical student, which is a long time ago. Um, you know, and that's, that is really going to, uh, to help a lot if, and that's a big concern that we all have, if used properly. Mm -hmm. If it's not being used uh, in, a, you know, in a way for all kinds of infections and uh, where it's not. So I think that um, the key now is that it is on the political agenda, but we need really supporting also uh, low middle income countries to, to, have this, you know, to have this double action, making sure that antibiotics are there for people who need it, and then there, that there is regulation about, you know, the, the, it's, uh, it's really, you can really buy them over the counter in most countries and that is the disastrous results. Mm -hmm. And let's not forget, several of the, um, the uh, nearly untreatable infections, the, the, the origin of these bugs can be traced back to, um, to developing countries, uh, you know, mm -hmm. because of misuse of antibiotics. Yes. Esther, if I could yes. tie that in as well to um, the use of, of antibiotics in animals. Um, I would guess most people in this room will have had a course of antibiotics, either, your, well, either yourself or, or a loved one over the past year. And increasingly several of us will have had to have a second or a third course because the first one didn't work. Now, you know, not everyone will put that immediately down as having a resistant organism, but that's probably the case. Yeah. It's probably <coughs> the case. Um, in many cases now, we're seeing the rise of multi-drug resistant organisms. So not only are they resistant to one drug or one class of drugs, they've actually developed resistance to multiple classes of drugs. And in some cases, we're down to the last line of defense. So an old drug called colistin, mm -hmm. which has mm. uh, all sorts of problems with it, um, liver toxicity and so on. Uh, earlier this year, there was a superb piece of investigative journalism that found Callistin, the Callistin manufacturer uh, in India, was also owned one of the major Indian chicken <laughs> manufacturers, and they were feeding Callistin to the chickens as a growth promoter. Uh, so it's no, which is horrendous. <laughs> Uh, but, and it's no surprise that there's now, or there are, we now find organisms with the uh, MCR1 gene, which is colistin resistance. Mm. That's uh, uh, transferable from one type of organism to another as well. So we're now facing the prospect of, of, of superbugs because of this overuse, highly likely because of this overuse of uh, last line of defense antibiotic as a, as a growth promoter. We're facing the, the prospect of truly untreatable mm -hmm. organisms. And so could I just add some clinical context? Yes, to please that? do. So yes. Th this is real, and this is yes. real within the UK. We are now seeing patients, not petri dishes, but patients who are colonized. Thankfully, they're rarely pathogenic at the moment, but we are seeing patients who are colonized with bacteria that are sensitive only to colistin, and it's a real clinical entity, right? Yeah. You mentioned the patient voice in your first question to me. We're very poor as clinicians at telling our patients that they have had a resistant pathogen identified. Mm -hmm. Some might perceive that they had their antibiotics changed and they only began to get better after the change of antibiotics, mm -hmm. but we don't acknowledge to them. We don't say, look, you've got a resistant bug here. The power of the patient voice in making this a real problem as opposed to a population level problem or as opposed to a microbiological phenomenon problem is hugely significant in driving the hearts and minds of our public, our media, and in turn our politicians. We've got to start being honest. Well, that's a really a good point because if patients are not being told that they had initial resistance to a particular class of antibiotics, how do we mobilize 
the patient community toward action. Have you seen this example in Denmark in terms of patients themselves really advocating for systemic change? Or where is the voice that really starts to articulate what the needs are, both at the patient level but also within the existing system? I think that Denmark for antibiotic resistance is a little island, uh, paradise yeah. island somehow, because uh, there has been a lot of attention uh, mm -hmm. in the past uh, 25 years, uh, I would say, and uh, starting, everything actually started by considering the use of antibiotics as growth promoters in animal productions. And that was uh, deemed actually in unacceptable because it would bring to resistant bacteria in animals that then could transfer to humans. So. Uh, I think that the very first actions were actually taken not by patients, but uh, by uh, scientists, by leaders, and then spread to the general population. What I find, I, I'm Italian, and I can find a, a huge difference between the perception of antibiotics and antibiotic resistance between Italy and Denmark. And uh, what always struck me was uh, this uh, consciousness of uh, the general population in how to handle antibiotics on the fact that uh, not insisting on the doctor to prescribe antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. I think there has always been a lot of focus on prevention and uh, we do not have, uh, luckily enough, uh, uh, big problems in the human population because there has been really focus on preventing the spread of resistant bacteria. Yes. But from the innovation perspective, if I can go back to that conversation that we had yeah. earlier, Peter, you talked a bit about how small and medium-sized enterprises are really beginning to create a pipeline, whether they're preclinical and some into clinical development, um, but can you talk about what the actual market failure is? Why do we not see more investment on the yeah. part of large pharmaceutical companies in developing the next generation of antibiotics? What, what is happening in the marketplace? The emergence of, of resistance has driven a, a very, very rapid realisation that what we're talking about now is a need for very precise medicines. So we need to give the right drug to the right patient at the right time. Uh, and we, if, if an organism is still susceptible to an existing antibiotic, we should use that. We don't want to use the new ones. Yeah. Uh, uh, broad, you know, as a broad spectrum agent, because all that we'll be doing is is driving resistance to the new things that we're developing. So, so actually, there's a there's a real problem there for developers. It's part of the reason why the and and investment has not kept pace with with the need over the past few years, and that's we we still need to sink hundreds of millions of dollars into developing new agents and then not use them. Mm -hmm. So this is probably the only area of, of yeah. pharmaceutical development uh, and, and reimbursement where uh, we need to figure out a better way of sharing the value of a new antibiotic with the developers because we're not going to allow them to uh, sell their product at large volume <coughs> in the marketplace to generate a return. That's fundamentally mm -hmm. one of the issues, and, and what uh, the international community is resolved to do is to address that by so-called pull mechanisms. So these these are new mechanisms to reward developers to get products available and on the shelf for uh, available for patients. Uh, now the UK is hopefully going to announce a trial of uh, a new pull mechanism. Uh, and once again, I think the whole international AMR community is looking to the UK to take that next leadership step, uh, actually going from policy and discussion uh, into implementing a new poll incentive for antibiotics in the UK. But we're only 5% of the international market, so it does need the rest of the world to follow. So <coughs> let, let me just come to a quick point before I, I come to you, Peter, yeah. around the whole concept of precision medicine mm. for antibiotics, which requires the use of data. Having the right antibiotic for the right patient at the right time, what does that require? If you can talk a little bit about that, Ron, and some of your efforts in terms of building patient registries, creating databases that could use algorithms to begin to equip physicians in terms of targeting the patients they have right in front of them. 
So I, I think the context, some non-physicians here might be slightly alarmed to learn that we don't know which patients to treat. We don't know who the right patient is, let alone what the right antibiotic mm -hmm. is. We have a one-size-fits-all diagnostic definition for sepsis, for example, which is, we've described as this very prevalent condition. That relies upon physiology. And the criteria are the same if you're an 18-year-old athlete as if you're an 88-year-old uh, patient with congestive cardiac disease and respiratory disease. The reality is their normal physiology, their baseline, is very, very different. And we treat every single patient in exactly the same way. Precision medicine has to be the way. We have a huge richness of data across the NHS, which we need to harness urgently. We have physiological data, we have biochemical data, hematological, microbiological. We have patient-reported symptomatology. We have prescribing data, and these exist across the spectrum of healthcare, not just in the secondary care se sector. If we can get these data systems to talk to each other, if we can make them interoperable, if we can apply machine learning to recognize the pattern at an individual patient level, of what badness looks like, mm -hmm. then we can start to apply this precision medicine to, the, uh, uh, medicine to our patients. Mm -hmm. The only way we can do that is to use existing data systems, build a registry, use machine learning on the available data, and learn what lessons we can. If we get this right, this now has application, not just here in the UK, mm -hmm. but globally, <coughs> and could be in conjunction with these other absolutely essential strategies, a game changer. Yeah, could be a real opportunity. Peter, if, sorry yes, to interrupt, sure. if I can actually add on yes. this, because I think this is a very important, a very important point, and if we can draw on the example of Denmark, it has been collecting data on antibiotic resistance and antibiotic use in the last 20, 25 years. And we can see that we can actually draw on that. This has helped for any kind of policy in reducing antibiotic use. We can find out how it affected antibiotic resistance. We can uh, um, design empiric therapy when they are needed based on the antibiotic resistance levels. So I think that uh, this uh, collection of data is uh, really a fundamental point because uh, uh, Usually we say what you can measure, you can manage, and that's the only way to actually manage uh, the crisis. That's right. I mean, and it's such a wide, wide um, you know, scale problem, right? The key question is going to be around how do you scale it and how do you make sure that it's adopted um, really across, across the world in order for it to be effective, but absolutely. Peter, I do want to come back yeah. to you because you had a point you wanted yeah, to... Yeah, actually two points, yes. and uh, it's uh, complementary to the data and the pool mechanism. One, in terms of data, we need also precision diagnostics. There is a real need for better diagnostics. Point of care, at the moment itself, not uh, that the lab brings you back uh, yeah. five days later, uh, so we, uh, because I've also been a, a, an infectious disease physician and that was the frustration. And that's also why the UK has launched the so-called longitude price. After a price that was uh, you know, launched in the 17th century, was trying to find what was the problem then, for a ship to know where is it in the middle of the ocean. And uh, that was longitude came out of the measurement. And here's a longitude price to, uh, after a popular vote organized through the BBC, uh, to find a, a point of care diagnostic that can differentiate between a bacterial infection where you need to give antibiotics and hopefully even more precise than that, and uh, others. Um, so that, that I think is where also the there is not that much of a market incentive to do that. That's why a price uh, can really uh, help. And secondly, much in healthcare, perhaps less so in this country, but in the rest of the world, is driven by reimbursement um, schemes and by what does whoever is the insurer, can be the state or privately, uh, private insurance, what is being paid for, what is reimbursed. And that, I think, we're still we need to do a lot of work on this one. This is where the UK system is pretty relevant for most countries in the world because of the national health system. And, uh, and so we need more of this kind of trials that Peter mentioned in other um, healthcare systems, um, but maybe they can be, you know, can drive really much more precisely and acutely by changing the uh, reimbursement uh, mechanisms, which would also then um, could become a, uh, an incentive for the pharmaceutical industry to invest in new uh, drugs because you can say, um, you can get a really good price provided that it's not a mass type of uh, broad spectrum uh, antibiotic. Uh, and that's where a dialogue between the insurers, the, the regulators mm -hmm. and industry is so key. 
The problem could be if you go, again, I, I, I was really interested by the panel this morning, if you go on a populist drive, then that kills the whole effort, <laughs> you know? Then there, there won't be drugs uh, that we need. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I could yeah. just pick up on that. Um, I think as, a, as an industry, what we really need to do is to demonstrate the value that our drugs, new drugs, existing drugs even, are uh, bringing to patients, but also to wider healthcare systems and to society. So new precision drugs that prevent the spread of, of further AMO have got a, an additional value to society. Yeah. And there's some really important work that's been going on um, in the UK, at the University of Sheffield and York, in, uh, and, and of course in Peter, in, in your organisations and yeah. others, to, to try and fully understand what that value is. And when we understand the value, everything about pricing, reimbursement, and the rest of it will, will flow from that. And, uh, and you're right, they, they, we will need experiments in different parts of the world because <coughs> every single country has got a different, uh, you know, an insurance model or a, a, a national health model like we have, but they're all different and they'll need to find their own solutions. But I think the, the really important thing is that someone needs to do it first. Hmm. Um, and this is again where, the, where everybody's hoping that the UK will uh, get a grip on that and uh, drive the uh, new trial, uh, hopefully in, in the first half of 2019. Yeah. But there's been significant investment, if you think about CARB-X and the work yeah. that uh, BARDA, which yeah. is a federal agency mm -hmm. in the United States, are doing towards putting some additional investments in uh, developing you also new line. You want to launch a big initiative? That's, yeah. that's yeah. right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so the, the question is, I mean, there's work that's happening right now. I think the big question I have is, what is this timeline? What is, when do we actually need to see new therapies come to market if we have these predictions that by 2050, we're going to see significant increase in death and mortality? Um, that's not a lot of time. And when you think about the drug development process, it feels like it's quite urgent of an issue. Um, so what's needed in the next two to three years and three to five years for us to make measurable impact? First of all, there are in, in many, mi many types of microbe, many resistant profiles, there are literally no new products in the pipeline, mm -hmm. in the drug pipeline, in, the clini in clinical trials. Uh, there are some combination products and there are some mechanisms to try and bypass current resistance mechanisms that can buy us the next three to five years, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, but looking out beyond that, uh, the, inse the incentives, the, the initiatives like Carbex are really excellent at priming the pump for uh, new, new research initiatives and, and new products that are being developed and helping to get them from preclinical testing in, into early clinical trials. Uh, but uh, Kevin Outerson from Carbex spoke at the All Party Parliamentary Group in, in the UK a couple of weeks ago. <coughs> he, he said, you could make R&D free unless you have a big pharma back in the game with the distribution manufacturing um, supply chain. Um, so yeah, we, we, things are happening, it's great. It's still not enough to, to, to meet the demand for uh, R&D spend uh, and we need to leverage that government initiative, those government initiatives to bring in private capital. But all of that really will not shift the dial unless we uh, fix the broken reimbursement model and get the pull incentives in place. Mm. You know, when you talked about, Valerie, that Denmark has been working on this for 25 years, it seems that progress has been made, right? What are the lessons learned from that experience? Because despite the fact that we have not seen new innovation, there seems to be potentially better control of the issue, and perhaps it's because there's focus from the prevention perspective, from the agricultural perspective. What can we learn from that experience in Denmark to inform other countries? Yeah, I'm very happy for this question because actually it's something that is uh, really on my heart and it's a message I wanted to take. I think that uh, no matter we are where we are in the world, um, there are like three main uh, pillars to fight uh, the superbugs and to fight uh, the antibiotic resistance. One is, of course, uh, uh, new drug development. Mm -hmm. But this is something that we have just learned that takes time. 
and it's something uh, that will be, uh, should be done continuously because uh, we are going uh, towards evolution of bacteria, mm -hmm. so it's not that we find a new drug, uh, then we are done mm -hmm. for the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. But uh, the other two uh, aspects uh, that I think also are very important for the low and middle income countries because it's something uh, applicable now is uh, uh, infection control, investment on infection control and uh, um, like weaken the spread of resistance, uh, limit the spread of resistance and also appropriate antibiotic use. Appropriate antibiotic use that goes hand in hand with improved diagnostics, um, education of the patients, education of the uh, prescribers. So I think uh, uh, these are the aspects where there is a lot of possibility, a lot of development. Technologies I don't think are used well enough in this area. I think that when we talk about uh, uh, infection control, we are still uh, at, uh, in some cases, as Florence Nightingale uh, <laughs> times. Okay, yeah. so yeah. there is more yeah. than washing hands is very important <laughs> in the hospitals or also in the veterinary practice <laughs> in a farm when you go in and out, but it's not the only thing. So where is uh, the use of new technologies for that? Yeah, I mean, and as we just talked about, you know, the UK has demonstrated leadership in making this a global issue. We have seen the US government respond as well, and WHO, the UN. So we've established it as a global priority. Mm -hmm. What's next? If you can all talk about what are the next two to three steps for what is needed from your different perspectives to move beyond establishing the priority to start to see implementation on the ground? Maybe I'll start with you, Peter. Yeah, I think it's really what Peter also said. Um, uh, it is now um, translating that into some action and have some um, could be demonstration project trials um, for certain things like uh, you know we, we know exactly what to do and we should implement it and that's a massive uh, I would say awareness campaign because patients can you know it can go the uh, either way I mean as we heard in uh, you know uh, a patient can put pressure on a, on, a, on a GP to prescribe antibiotics but a patient can be an advocate and let's get serious about this. So I think information communication about this is really very important and then um, learning how to do it and documenting it in, in, and it should be in, in, in not just in the UK and, uh, that, that's, and, and not only in high income countries. Mm -hmm. The awareness of it in low income countries is frankly not so great at the moment. Yeah. And mm. you know, Peter Jackson, you have issued some recommendations recently. Yes. What are the three or four actions that you recommended are needed? Well, we talked already about the pull incentives and I, I, I can't emphasize enough how important a signal that will be to, to the whole industry. Um, I think the two other recommendations from the report, uh, first of all, is that we need really effective government and cross-departmental government uh, collaboration with the philanthropic sector, with private investors, and in particular with SMEs, because SMEs are generating probably 90, 95% of the new technology and the new pipeline mm -hmm. that are out there. So we need an effective mechanism for uh, governments and, and industry to be able to, to pull all that together into effective, leveraged, funding mechanisms uh, and then the, the the second thing is that uh, it, with a em particular emphasis on the UK I mentioned before that companies are significantly undercapitalized mm. we need to uh, uh, and, not, uh, and because of that there's some superb science in academia that's not translating out from our universities world-class universities into biotech uh, and, and into big pharma because big pharma is hardly there as well. I should say, do not take any of my comments <coughs> as being critical of big pharma. I think the companies that are in, we should be congratulating them for being in uh, and doing whatever we can to get more big pharma companies engaged, engaged in, our, uh, in our mission. Uh, but we need to look, look maybe earlier than the funding and the the sort of resources that we can apply and that Carvets can apply to bridge that earlier gap of translation of science out from universities into new biotechs. So in our report, we, we said that the UK could have the ambition to treble the number of SMEs, for example. 
and uh, half of that will be by effectively translating new products out from uh, universities into, into new spin-outs and, and, and companies. The other half will be by growing and, uh, and inward investment, bringing companies to UK to use the world-class infrastructure that we have in, in the NHS and, and our universities. Yeah. And you and I talked earlier uh, about 52,000 individuals in the UK die mm -hmm. of sepsis every year. What's needed from your perspective to address the issue? Well, I think, firstly, looking at the, the top level here, we need a coordinated poli policy response on this, whether this be at a national level, a regional level, or indeed a global level. We're talking really about infections management. We're not just talking about antimicrobial stewardship and antimicrobial resistance. There are three pillars. Uh, you mentioned three pillars. I have another three. <laughs> infections management is about infection prevention, which has to be about clean water, sanitation, hygiene, vaccination, and infection control practices. It has to be about antimicrobial stewardship and new drug development in all of its forms. And the third pillar has to be recognising that infection will still occur, it can be life-threatening, and in the case of sepsis and malaria and TB, it needs urgent intervention. And we have to address those with equal vigour mm -hmm. rather than in silos. Secondly, we talked about diagnostics, and I'd just like to clarify from my side that yes. diagnostics... We talk largely about pathogen identification, which is hugely important but there's a translational gap between identifying the pathogen and it influencing prescribing behaviour. And mm. we have to understand that translational gap, understand the clinical prescribing pressures on clinicians and why they choose to ignore the identified pathogen and its resistance. But the other area is the diagnostics around recognising who needs antimicrobials. And I talked about the registry and precision medicine, which we do need, but this is also about investment in, in biomarker, um, identification and biomarker panels to help the clinicians to determine what they do. And then we talk about the broader behavioural aspects for number three, which is around, this has to be around educating and empowering our public and making them own part of this problem of antimicrobial resistance. So we have to change that behaviour. But as I alluded to in the second phase, we also have to change clinician prescribing behaviour. Yeah. We have to mm. give them the tools. I would foresee in the future based upon a deep understanding of what constitutes the phenotype of the patient need treating. A GP, for example, sitting in her surgery, looking at a mathematically modelled algorithm, and that algorithm will tell that GP whether that patient requires antimicrobials and whether that patient requires referral for hospital assessment. Those three things in place, we're a step closer. Excellent. Okay, last but not least, Valeria, what do you think is needed from a global perspective from where you sit in really addressing this issue? Yeah, so I would say that definitely uh, addressing the use of antibiotics in animals and uh, banning what is uh, the unnecessary use. Growth promotion, treating animals that uh, are not sick uh, is actually should be a no-go. Uh, we should consider that uh, the amount of antibiotics uh, that are used uh, uh, for animals in industrialized countries actually outnumber the amount of antibiotics that is used for humans. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of these antibiotics are used unnecessarily just to um, make it up for farm management uh, conditions that are not maybe the most appropriate for, uh, for the animals. So I think that acting on that would be a very, very relevant part. It should go uh, tightly interconnected with the measurement of resistance. I think that uh, if we only tell people avoid the use of antibiotics, but they cannot measure the effect, uh, it will not be a sustainable action in the long term. Uh, I think that, for example, farmers uh, and the uh, agricultural sector in Denmark are really empowered by the fact that uh, when they stopped uh, the growth promoters uh, in, uh, back in 96, uh, they had uh, the VRE, the vancomycin-resistant enterococci, that are bacteria that can cause endocarditis. I mean, they, they can make us die. They went from 80% in uh, chicken products to undetectable level in a matter of uh, 15 years. So, that uh, is a tangible measure and that uh, tells them, okay, maybe I have to do efforts in improving my management, maybe I have to spend more money for uh, raising uh, the animals, but then I have uh, a measurable effect. Yeah. 
And it, I just add to that yes. that what we haven't discussed is using the retailers as a drive to improve farming behaviour. In in your home country, in Italy, yeah. the co-op now have refused to accept from suppliers any chicken that has mm -hmm. any antimicrobials within it. And I, I think using retailers as a driver is a huge step forward. And even individuals' behaviour, right? Yeah. When you go to the yeah. shop and you refuse mm -hmm. to buy products that have antibiotics in it, you are making a decision with your purse book, right? Sorry to interrupt you, and I know it's very late, yes. but I think it's a very, very important yes. message. Our meat, eggs, and milk do not have antibiotic. At least the way we produce, we already know that. Uh, so it's about antibiotic resistance. So, so this yes. label, antibiotic-free products, can actually be very misleading. Mm. So we should, uh, um, as experts, we should actually emphasize uh, that it's about antibiotic resistant bacteria and not about antibiotics being uh, in, the, in, yeah. in the food. Can, Esther, can I, can I make, I know we're, we're short on time, but yes. can I make the link between that and what Peter mentioned earlier about, about medicines being available, the existing medicines being available? As we reduce our prescribing in, in Western markets, we're now starting to see shortages of ex the existing generic antibiotics yeah, yeah. because manufacturers with very thin margins mm. who are seeing their volumes reduce are coming under incre increasing pressure and they're very rational mm. and the rational response is to close a plant down. Mm. So over the past few years there have been 150 notified shortages of antibiotics in the US market. Mm. And the knock-on impact of that is mm -hmm. just de even de ben denying even patients. Penicillin, benzathine, penicillin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. We have a few minutes, three minutes and 40 seconds to be exact. <laughs> um, <laughs> for audience questions, just please introduce yourself. Yes, please. Oh, and it's Lance Price. I'm, I'm Lance Price, I <laughs> direct the Antibiotic Resistance Action Center. Yeah. Um, excellent panel. Um, Ron, I, I recognize that, that sepsis is the syndrome that kills, but when I think about precision medicine and diagnostics, I think we should be focusing on the more common infections that lead to sepsis because that's where the bulk of antibiotics are being used. And there's a major market failure. We've talked about market failures when it comes to drugs, mm -hmm. but when it comes to diagnostics, there's a market yeah. failure too because oh, yeah. that's right. the diagnostic companies <coughs> won't come in yeah. unless they know a physician will use it, and yeah. a physician or a clinician won't use it unless they know it's going to get paid for. Can you talk about this? Can the mm. panel discuss this a little bit? Yeah, that's a great question. Great point. Yeah, so, so I think my initial response is that this refers back to this translational or behavioral science um, undertaking that we have to. Uh, pathogen identification describes that. We have novel molecular techniques for pathogen identification. Completely agree with you. This is not just about the sepsis mm. space. This is about infection as a, as a whole. But in terms of identifying pathogens, molecular techniques largely are not valued or trusted at the coalface. They don't tend to influence on individual prescribing behavior, and they only do so when there's been a dialogue between an infection specialist and the attending clinician. So we have to understand that, that pressure. Why do we keep going back to blood cultures as the gold standard for pathogen identification and ignore the fact that we've got these molecular techniques? So I, I completely agree with you. What about the reimbursement issue? So if a general practitioner fails to use a tool, but it's not going to get reimbursed, that really stands in the way of adoption. Yeah, yeah and we, we've demonstrated in England, not mm -hmm. across the UK, that it is possible to incentivize antimicrobial usage for time critical condition, particularly yeah. sepsis, without resulting in adverse consequence. So we've had a commissioning incentive for hospitals across 72% of English mm -hmm. hospitals over the last nearly three years now that have shown the rate of early delivery of antimicrobials increased from 30 something percent to over 80% with an actual per capita reduction in total antimicrobial consumption in hospitals. So it can be done responsibly, but we just need to understand the behavioral aspects. Yeah, fantastic. It's a, it's a great question that comes to the heart of the understanding value. Uh, because at the moment, in many healthcare systems, value is price of in, in a, a pharmacy. Whereas, you know, if we, if we widen it out, then, you know, the diagnostics, the use of diagnostics starts to enter into that uh, value equation. We had another question. What? Yes, please. Hi, hi there. Um, my name is Sunir Kemke. Um, I run the population health department of a um, company called Aetna, which is a big U.S. insurer. Not familiar with it. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to comment. I mean, it's it's difficult for payers, even large payers, to make isolated uh, policy changes. Hmm. The issue that we face is that we're not supported by public policy and not mm. supported by regulation in issues like AMR. And so, if we stop paying or reduce payments and reimbursements 
for uh, antimicrobials where they're being inappropriately used, the backlash that we get is politically very difficult and actually easier just to get on with it and pay for the reimburse these things. So what we need is strong support from public policy and from regulators, um, which goes not only into the clinical prescribing do domain, but into the agricultural domain. Um, and I just want to invite a question about regulation. Does the panel think it's ineffective? Um, is regulation not put into place? Is it that it only happens in certain geographical pockets across agriculture and uh, the clinical prescribing industry? Do you want to take that, Valeria? Who, who wants to take this question? Have we seen regulation in Denmark? Has that been effective? Uh, yes, definitely, definitely. This is an example that uh, I took. Uh, I took earlier. This uh, when the growth promoter use uh, was banned. Actually, there was a, a huge drop uh, in the in the prevalence of antibiotic resistant bacteria. And uh, there are a lot of regulations, like in, at least in the uh, agricultural sector, there are a lot of regulations on the, um, the kind of antibiotics that you can use. Uh, for example, those that are considered more, most important for uh, human health are actually not allowed to be used in animals, with very, very few exceptions that have been documented. Um, every kind of prescription should go uh, through the hands of a doctor, a medical doctor or a veterinarian, so there is no free access uh, to medicines. And I think that uh, if we look at the uh, general statistics at EU level where Denmark is in the human population, in the animal population, we can see that uh, that definitely has a, a positive effect. Fantastic. Well, we are out of time. Please join me in thanking the panel.